Hello friends, welcome to the Jazz Ranch. Hip cats and groovy chicks, you know, it's the end of summer and you know, we're still inside, we're still confined, we're not seeing our friends, we're not socializing like the way we normally do and it's kind of depressing and down, but I want to give you some encouragement and some hope. I want to give you a positive video and, and the philosophy of Wayne Shorter. You know, Wayne Shorter was a great innovator in the 60s saxophone player played with Miles and this particular album um, this particular song came from his album called Speak No Evil and he said this I think that music opens portals and doorways into unknown sectors that it takes courage to leap into I, I always think that there's a potential that we all have and we can emerge and rise up to this potential when necessary. We have to be fearless, courageous, and draw upon wisdom that we think we don't have. I like that quote from Wayne Shorter. So here we go. I'm going to talk about this video later on and uh, the Wayne Shorter concept in this, in this song. Here we go with Fee. Fi fo fum. Now you may be wondering why I picked out this song Fee Fi Fo Fum by Wayne Shorter and the reason is it's an example of the mid-60s innovative jazz, in other words a break through from the post-bop, from bebop and post-bop and modal jazz into a new, a new style or a new concept which was not diatonic and yet incorporated modal concepts as well as blues and this one is very interesting because the first a, two A sections are non-diatonic and then it goes into more like a blues feel in the middle in the bridge section 
on dominant seventh chords and then has a third section going back to the original A section but it but it is it contrasts at the end but it diverges and it uses um, some tritone substitutes and some altered chords that you wouldn't expect which make it sort of difficult to improvise in a way because we're used to improvising in a diatonic way with two five ones into a key and this diverges from that and goes into chords which don't even fit within within the key that you're in. It doesn't even have a key signature. But if you read songs from uh, fake books, and this one is in the real book one, uh, there's actually mistakes in it. Uh, anyway, but uh, let's let's look through it a little bit, and I want to talk about how you might approach playing on this chord progression. Okay, the interesting thing about this song is we try to understand what is the key we're in. And there's no key signature on the score. So generally we look to the last note of the melody as being an indication of what key we're in because it usually ends on the one. In other words, in this tune it ends on B flat. So you might say, okay, we're in the key of B flat. But the chord is not B flat. It's a B major seven with a sharp 11 just that note. But that last note being so strong in the tune indicates that maybe the, we are in the key of B flat, but we could also be in the key of E flat. The first chord of the song is an E flat 7 with this note. But interestingly enough, it goes from E flat 7 to D7 sharp 9, and then a G minor chord. Now, G minor is relative to B flat major as being the relative minor. So we don't really get to a, any kind of a B flat chord until the um, eighth measure, in which there's a B flat seven. So it goes, you know, E flat, D seven, G minor, A flat minor, B major, D seven, G minor, uh, D minor, G seven, then repeating G flat, F, and then B flat, seven then it goes to E flat but I think that's really the four chord like in a blues you know like we're in a blues on B flat to an E flat we're, and we're starting out on the E flat on that bridge then to B flat B flat seven now B flat seven is not the key of B flat it's indicating that it's the key of E flat, but because the E flat is dominant seven, you know, we're really not in E flat. E flat could indicate we're maybe we're in the key of A flat, but there's no A flat chord in the song of any in significance. There's a couple of passing chords on that, an A flat minor, an A flat major, but I think we're in the key of B flat because of the ending note being on B flat. So like if you were to end it, it would be B flat major seven and then it would end on B flat. Like that. And so what happens in the bridge is it's really going to the four chord on a blues like this would be B, B flat. E flat would be the four chord. So we're going to the four chord. One chord, two, three, e flat, four chord. Right? And then so on. So, and also that indication of the uh, tritone substitute of the E flat seven to the D seven sharp nine going to the relative minor of G minor. That's that's a very strong indication of the key of B flat because G minor is the um, relative minor of B flat. And still, instead of going to B flat, you would expect expect it to go to B flat. It goes to B major. So this is very interesting. And then you have the D D seven, then the D minor G seven. What is the D minor G seven? Well, that's just the two five of C minor, which is the two chord of B flat. See, that's another indication that we're really in the key of B flat. And then the ending passage of E flat, 
to D7 sharp 9, to D flat, to D7, and then to B. Those all indicate that the res resolution is going to be on B flat. So I think we're in the key of B flat here. So how would I approach the first four bars improvising? It's E flat 7 to a D7 sharp 9 and to a G minor. Those first three chords, and then it goes up a half step to an A flat minor. So those, that, those first two measures, I can conceive of those as an approach to a G minor chord, which would be, uh, you know, the three chord of an E flat. So uh, we can think of the E flat seven as maybe a tritone substitute going to the D seven sharp nine as being the five of the G minor. So we're really thinking G minor. There goes the half step, which is easy to conceive of because we just move whatever idea we have up a half step. Like if it's this, we go. But then it goes into B flat major. Now, what is B flat major doing there? Well, in um, if we were playing an E flat minor, that would be the flat six chord going to the five and then to E flat. But it goes. B flat major, then it goes to D7, which has no relationship to it, and then it does a 2-5 in C. So uh, how am I going to play on those logically? Well, the thing is, like, that part's easy, and then up a half step. Now I get the B major, now I'm there in that scale. And now how do I go to D and then D minor, G7? Well, there you can't, my idea is you can't really think of each one of those scales. You can't think of B major, then D7, the D7 scale, then the D minor 7, then the G7 scale. You just have to think maybe one scale and play the chords within it and then maybe shift like that maybe. In other words, a slight shift, but I don't have to be playing something like this in which like I'm going to play every note in the scale. But, and then we want to know those, but we don't want to, we want to make it melodic, and you cannot play melodically that way. You have to play an idea that is melodic, and it just has to be rubbing with the chord. Now that's what I think is the essence, like maybe something like this. That would work, see? An idea, a melodic idea. And then to there. So, the other thing is like I try to, in order to, with something like this, I, order, I try to play a moving line and then come to a pause on a target tone. So I might do this. And then come to a pause there. And then, then less movement, you know. So I might have a lot of movement. Now when I get to the middle, in the bridge now, I, the feel changes into a blues feel and I can start playing blues scale licks. So now on this middle section, the bass is playing in four, before it was playing in two, so now it starts to swing harder. So now I can play, I'm going to comp differently in my left hand, more rhythmically. I'm playing bluesy now. You know. In other words, blues scale, right? I'm like, you know. So, I'll, so there, change the feel changes, and that's what makes the song so interesting is that you can change the way you're playing from. A more esoteric kind of idea, you know, out there kind of thing, and then come back to reality and you know, play like a really bluesy groove. 
you know? So that's the fun of, of, of playing a song like this. It's challenging to play on the A sections and then on the B sections, you can just relax and groove, you know? Now, the other thing that makes this song so interesting is the rhythm of it. In other words, it's, it has a lot of combinations of downbeat, upbeats, and accents falling on beats you wouldn't expect them, like on four. You know, you expect the strong beats to be on one and three, and then you have like and, so you have like, uh, just starting out, you have one, two, three, and. One, two, three, and four, and a one, two, and. You know, and then you have a one, two, and. And then you have an and. Then, then, and, 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 four. So that hit there is right on four. Then you have, now it's pretty much bluesy. One and two, three, and a one and two, three, and. One and two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and like that. In other words, you have interesting rhythms. Two, three, four. So the rhythmic aspect of this song, even at the end there, you have um, one. Let's see. One, two, and three, four. Accents where you wouldn't expect them. So not, not only do you have an interesting melodic concept, interesting harmonic concept with a simple blues in the middle, but you have all these rhythms that are unexpected, that you don't expect. So that's what makes it sound so fresh and innovative and new sounding. So wrapping up, I think this is a good song to learn to play not only for the challenge of its, if its chords and voicings and me melodic line, but its rhythms. And to be able to put the accents in the right place. And then be able to play a blues feel in the middle. It has a lot of variety to it. And it's very in innovative for its time, you know. And it still sounds fresh even today. Like, like many of the innovators of the 60s, their, their songs are still innovative. Remember, Miles played this as well, and, and you know, Wayne Shorter with uh, Herbie Hancock and Freddie Hubbard made this a very popular song in its time. So uh, it's a good one to learn, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Signing off from the Jazz Ranch, thanks so much for tuning in tonight. Please keep in touch. I really appreciate hearing from you. Please write to me. I always write to all my comments, all people who contribute to my website and and write to me i and write to my email i will always write back to you so until next time i'll say swing loose be cool and we'll see you around the block bye bye <laughs>